Good evening, everybody. Um, a German newspaper has, they do a everyday interview asking people to choose how happy you are for that day. Uh, so everybody keys in, uh, well, the, 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 the fee, just the feeling of yours. So uh, from one to a hundred, what's yours today? Seventies, uh, raise your hand, seventies. 80s, 90s, 10. <laughs> anyway, I was curious to see what is the average. You know, every, and people vote every day. Uh, guess what's the average of the happiness people answer? 50? Well, with Germans, I, you would expect 50, yes. <laughs> Are there any Germans here? <laughs> but, but I was pleasantly surprised. The, the average is actually 80. Can you believe that? Well, if you ask the UK citizens nowadays, probably not that high. <laughs> or the Americans, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, what a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, first of all, let me share with you a reader's letter that I recently got. It's in Chinese, of course, I translate. It says, I come from Shandong province, and I'm 20 years old. I have a problem with faith, with what I should believe in. All my life, I have believed in anything and everything school teachers and parents have told me. But third year into college, I have a feeling that I'm floating in the sea. We have no religious faith. Anything that's religious is called superstition. And I can't believe in superstition, can I? Then the faith in communism went bankrupt in the 80s with the rise of enlightenment. She's only 20, you know. Um, the unconditional embracing of prosperity, money and all, of the 90s is something that I cannot believe in. So everything that I receive at universities now, I think they are all lies. What's worse, the deconstructionist approach from the West, which tears down what I was about to believe in truth, in progress, in eternal values, takes away the floor beneath me. I don't want to spend my life floating like the rootless water plants, but what can I hold on to? What can I believe in? So this is the letter. I was very moved by the letter, and I don't intend to offer any answers to the questions in today's talk, but the letter to me illustrates some traits which are very pertinent to the zeitgeist of today's world. And I try to sum them up. One, the, the distrust of authority, for example, government. Two, the distrust of establishment, which includes teachers, professors, parents, institutions, uh, leading thinkers, so on and so forth. Three, a heightened sense of the self. This reader is very aware of her situation in a collective society. Four, idealism. This 20-year-old thinks and she refuses to just drift with the flow. Every time I get a letter like this, I feel encouraged and heartened. I remember myself at that age asking all kinds of fundamental and lofty questions such as, what is the meaning of life? You know? And the older we get, I think <laughs> my friends here, <laughs> they are smiling because they know what I'm talking about. The older we get, the, um, the lower, uh, closer to ground we become. So the distrust of authority and uh, establishment characterizes our time and age. Do you not agree? 
It definitely is, it, and it's a global phenomenon. So being a student from the 1970s, tell me, if you are, you were student of the 60s and 70s, would you raise your hand and say hello to me? So uh, when I talk about me and I, that actually I'm probably I'm talking about us and we. So <clears throat> I belong to the generation to be distrusted by the younger ones. Therefore, I'd like to talk about generational rifts today by sharing with you my own experiences of growing up, through which you may be able to see what shapes our generation. So. Um, you probably could, would have expected that I would start from uh, two uh, my research objects. I, I used to have two teenagers in my home because I raised them. So of course, uh, I observed them. I never really paid much attention to jargons like Generation X, Y, Z, because I always thought, well, these are probably inventions of those uh, sales managers who are trying to target uh, uh, consumer markets. But the idea of a generational difference did surface when I noticed that my children, who would fall into the group called millennials, when I noticed that they do develop a different attitude about consuming, uh, consuming goods. I remember once they accompanied me to, um, to do window shopping in Paris. They, wait, they waited very patiently on the pavement because they wouldn't bother to go in with me. What a boring thing to do. And when they saw me coming out with bags, I remember it was Philip. Philip said, Mom, why do you always buy clothes impulsively? Do you buy clothes impulsively, Annie? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> but anyway, um, they, they are always very cruelly honest with me. But I was surprised, so I said, well, if you don't buy clothes um, impulsively, how do you do it? <laughs> um, so they explained. Uh, there are many young people here, and I'm very curious if you are like them. So they explain, they buy an item when they see the need. And they study about the item on the internet before they actually go and buy the thing. So I listened, I said, well, no big deal. That's the way I buy refrigerator and, and washing machines. <laughs> One time when we were walking down a fine street in Vienna, again I was impulsively going into a store, but this time I was, I was pulled back by, again by Philip. Who was, he said, um, Mom, don't go in there. Just don't. It's a particular brand of store, and you know this, the brand. I, I, don't want, I, I wouldn't mention the, the name of the brand. His argument was this. He said, Mom, just look at the price of this pair of jeans, 7.99 euro, of course, 7.99. Um, do you know, madam, what is behind one pair of jeans? Do all of you know? Maybe many of you do. I, I didn't. So he went on. This, uh, he was in his early, early 20s. He said, to produce one pair of jeans requires 1,800 gallons of wa water. Uh, 400 megajoule, megajoule of energy. I have never even heard of a megajoule. <laughs> MJ, megajoule. Uh, don't laugh, have you heard of it? <laughs> 400 megajoule of energy and three kilos of chemicals for one pair of jeans. Okay, and then he, he went on to say, and seven ninety nine, ma mother, you are a writer and you are a critic. Do you never ask if there's seven ninety nine when it ends up in the store in Vienna, how much do they pay the workers back in Guang, in Dongguan, in Guangzhou? So I stood there, speechless. Um, it took me a while to realize that. Here's a generational difference in attitude. Indeed, it is there. My parents, my parents, so they are called by sociologists or newspapers as the what generation? The silent generation. I don't like the term at all. Why do you call it? 
well, what do we call them, silent generation. But my parents would save every penny and make their own clothes by cutting the fabric. And then, as to me, I grew up with uniforms. Um, the schools would demand us to wear only uniforms to avoid uh, peer competition. And then because we were poor, so outside of school time, we didn't have anything else either. We would continue to wear the black and white uniform. So I grew up with only the knowledge about uniforms. So um, my impulsive way of buying, of course, I don't go shopping that often, so don't get it wrong. It's just when they were with me, then they found me uh, impulsive, and they're very critical with me, overly critical with me. Anyway, so um, the difference in this attitude actually is a result of me growing up um, not knowing uh, the complicated art of fashion because you did not have that environment. So it's indifference and it's ignorance about that part of the world. For the next generation, however, what technology offers, I realized, is not just a massive amount of disconnected inf information. It actually is a basis for the younger generation to form their judgment and opinions. They don't jump into the store and buy things. Instead, they will compare prices, they examine the uh, materials, and they uh, review the manufacturing process, and they, then, they, they even verify the, the ethic background of this commodity. This is what they do. I was really very impressed when I found out. So I asked them once, are you particularly like this or are your friends all like this? The answer is yes, their friends do that. Okay. Uh, so the lesson I got was that millennials are in no ways less socially responsible than us, the baby boomers. They're not less. And the massive information technology has offered them makes them probably even more knowledgeable and global-minded than the previous uh, uh, generations. Next experience. I once asked my parents what um, image they remember me when I was a teenager. Uh, can you guess? It's a very simple one. They remember me as a teenager. I don't know, students of the 70s, probably all the same. Uh, they remember me, it's very easy, bending over a book, wearing a black and white uniform, that's all. As a teenager, that's very serious, you know? You're going to take, take, take upon the whole world and you have to study hard. So when I think of my sons growing up in the 1990s, the picture is of them crouching in bed, a notebook computer on their knees, an iPhone, a, a smartphone in their hand, earphones on their head, and the amazing thing is everything is on. <laughs> so he will be finger texting with several friends at the same time, talking on the phone to someone else, listening and watching a video, multitasking involving sound, sight, touch. And when the baby boomer mother walks in and sits on his bed and demands, can't you stop everything, just talk to me for five minutes? And he would, in, with, all, in, with all due respect, uh, in all innocence, he said, haven't you heard of multitasking? I could do all this while still listening to you. And I would say, well, it's so disrespectful, you know. <laughs> I sound like a parent, and it's so disrespectful. Anyway, so he would stop everything. Um, and, said, and then turn to me and say, now I'm all yours. But how can you really talk like this? All the, machi all the machines are on. It's like... It's like trying to talk in the emergency room in the hospital. All the machines are, are ticking. So, but my, my, my prejudice about the net generation, 
being multitasking monsters, technical freaks, and、uh, with an overdose of very superficial audio-visual feedings. My prejudice was challenged one time because I saw Andy.、Uh, my readers are probably more familiar with Andy. Right?、Well, it was Andy.、Uh, this was in his early twenties. He had ear his earphone on almost all day, and I was getting pretty edgy, you know. And、uh, but later on, I realized it's good that I asked him, "What are you listening all day with that earphone?" You know, it cuts you off from the rest of the world, especially it cuts you off, cuts you off from me. I realized he. Well, he spent a whole week, and he was listening to the a whole volume of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. I forgot my computer altogether, my PPT altogether. Do you still want to see it? <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm not, I'm not the I generation, you know. <laughs> I'm the baby boomer. <laughs> Should we go back <laughs> now? This is taken. This is a picture from Dongguan. Uh, jeans factory, and this is the Roman Empire. <laughs>、uh, um, so again, I got a lesson. The I generation I doesn't mean me I. It's it means iPhone I small I. Okay, the I generation does not necessarily read less simply because. He is not holding a paper book in his hand, not necessarily. It was a wake-up call for me, which says, "Stop looking at the younger generation only through your own lenses." However, it is really very tough, very easy to change lenses. It's so hard. After all, are we not all defined by our personal? As well as generational histories, we are we are defined by the way we grew up, and that is why I would like to share with you this evening the way I grew up, and、um, <clears throat> that way you probably、um, when you go home tonight, and if you're young, you go home tonight, you treat your parents differently. <laughs>、um, so I'm sharing with you my generational. History. It's so good that we have different generations in this in this hall.、Uh, if you are under 20,、uh, under 19, can you raise your hand? Wave at me. Under 19, under 19. Okay. When you are 19 and 40, can you raise your hand to me? 19 and 40. Okay. When okay, now we're going up and up and up. <laughs> Shall we do that? Okay. If you are between fifty and seventy-five, raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody over eighty here? We love you. We love you. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> okay. So I was born in the year nineteen fifty-two. And I don't have to test you what you know about 1952. That was the year when the Korean War was going on. Under the UN, 16 countries sent troops, and 41 countries sent aid to the battlefield in Korea, fighting against the Chinese and the North Koreans. Do you know the casualty of the Korean War? Uh, the end count is three million lives were lost, 1952. And in China, the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries, 政反政压反革命 was just drawing to an end. The total number of people executed as a result of the campaign, according to official account, was. Seven hundred and twelve thousand people killed because of the campaign. According to private sources, it's two million. So that's 
At the same time, Taiwan, my Taiwan, had its own share of terror. About 30,000 cases of treason, mostly against alleged communist sympathizers or collaborators, were brought to the military court, and thousands of them uh, received death penalties, 1952. Um, McCarthyism, 1952. It was the intense stage of the Cold War, McCarthyism in the U.S. was systematically uh, checking the political loyalty of the government employees or the board, and the, the system was also sending uh, many, many intellectuals and professors into unemployment because of their supposed sympathy with communism. Um, in 1952, the United States tested the first hydrogen bomb, which was a thousand times more powerful than the original atomic bomb. And the year, fo uh, the year following that, the, the USSR did the same thing. So that was the time and age. Um, in the year I was born, around me were all kinds of diseases Give me names of diseases that's around in 1952. Give me one disease, name of disease. What can you think of? Malaria, Malaria yes. Anything else? <coughs> TB, yes. Anything else? Typhoid. Typhoid, is that? Yes. If you were 20, can you, give, can, can you tell me what diseases were there? It's, I got the names from the, uh, from the baby boomers. So uh, millennials tell me, in 1952, what kind of disease do you imagine is there? Um, have you heard of, um, um, let's see, cholera? Cholera? Does anybody know what cholera is? OK. Um, so cholera, malaria, Typhus were diseases that I learned not from books but from personal encounters. So I, people like me, I will remember uh, one day being dispersed. The whole class, the whole school was dis were, was dismissed. We went home, and when we came back, some some schoolmates were missing because they died in the cholera outbreak. So it's not from from books, and nobody has mentioned polio. Polio. Um, <coughs> I have to show you the pictures of 1950s, before that vaccine was invented, how polio children were treated. Oh, no, this is Van Gogh, I forgot. <laughs> this is a campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries. Okay, they are related. Uh, do you see the logic in here? Okay, on the left side is the communist cadre who was catching the, the, the nationalist uh, spies it's on the left. And on the right, it shows a nationalist, meaning Taiwanese, nationalist uh, soldier uh, persecuting a nice citizen. And, and, and this other citizen was crying out, please rescue us Taiwanese. So these were propaganda um, posters from the early 1950s. Um, but there you go, polio. Uh, it's called the iron lung. Before the vaccine, you see hundreds and thousands of children spending all their lives, once they got the disease, in such tubes. I know someone <coughs> who died in the 50s, late 50s, and he had spent many, many years in this iron lung. You don't get out of it. So when I first saw it, I didn't know what it is. Um, so I did some research on this. Um, <clears throat> have you heard of the DDT? Do you know what DDT is? Again, <laughs> the students from the 70s. DDT is a colorless pesticide. And you spray it against uh, malaria and typhus. 
I grew up, or we grew up with, with DDT. So I remember the, I had a sweet memory of uh, every evening my father would kick all of us out. We lived in a small Japanese house. We were all kicked out to, to, to be in the yard, and he would stay inside and use a can, and he sprayed the DDT every corner of the house. And so the Hong Kong was doing the same. Um, and. Uh, a couple hours later, we would go back in, and we would sleep happily in that faint, sweet scent of the DDT. <laughs> um, <clears throat> something like 40 years later, I realized the DDT was poison. It kills birds. Um, <clears throat> it causes cancer. And it was banned later. So I thought, oh, that, um, that means that I was, I really grew up in a so called third world country, you know. You grew up with DDT and you thought the smell was nice. Until I read the um, autobiography of, of Hillary Clinton. There's one small passage there I, I caught my eye. I was like, really? She described when she was. Um, a small child riding bicycles on the street in her hometown with other kids. Um, I think it's suburb of Chicago, I don't remember. But anyway, they would spray the DDT on the, on the street with a huge truck. It's like we, our truck spraying water to clean the street. And the truck would spray DDT. And she described she and her children friends would ride their bicycle, waiting for the truck to come. And all of them ride about tiny bicycles and pedaling after this truck to smell DDT. <laughs> and I thought, OK, but the US was not a third world country. But we were, we all, we were all enjoying the DDT, you know. And, and of course, I cannot forget that when a teacher in our class would find a girl uh, uh, having lice in the hair, <clears throat> what he would do is pull the girl here and uh, uh, hold her head down and spray the DDT into her hair <laughs> completely over and over five times, and then took a towel and wrap her up so that the DDT spray would, so would soak into her scalp, you know, just to make sure of that. That's the way we grew up. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, 50s. Uh, wars and wars and wars and poverty and diseases. <clears throat> now, the formative years will begin when you are, say, 10 years old. When I was 10, 1962. Um, <clears throat> I lived, or we lived in a Japanese house on the harbor of Kaohsiung, which is a Navy base. On my way from the harbor from my home to and from, from my home to the school every day, I would walk along this big boulevard and uh, I would see American soldiers. This is my first sighting of American soldiers. I would see American soldiers in, in sailors' uh, outfit swarming the street, chasing after Taiwanese bar girls. <coughs> the young men were like wild animals just let out of a cage, and the girls were playing coquette, earning their livelihood. Only years later did I realize what this was all about, what I saw every day. That was 1962. The US began to bomb Vietnam. And more, and more soldiers were sent from the US to the battleground. The, the soldiers that I saw on the street were young men relieved from the battlefield for a couple of days vacation. And they would not know how much longer they have to live. That was the sight. That was my very innocent encounter with a nearby war. At the same time, the Remember the Cuban crisis, 1962? The Cuban crisis was taking place. I was too young to understand that the two superpowers at that time nearly started the Third World War, a nuclear war. And this was also about the time. Later on, I was, Ger I was married to a German man. I lived uh, for that many years in Germany, and I was at the Berlin Wall when it fell apart. But 1962, when I was young, the Berlin Wall was shut up, was built up uh, almost overnight in August 1961. 
Um, <coughs> And, uh, uh, and, and, and Germans were, uh, were shot at and led, bled to death while they were climbing over the wall trying to meet with their families. That was also the year, 1962, when my family received a um, mysterious letter from Hong Kong. My parents were so frightened that they locked the front door, dimmed the lights, uh, hushed us up. They opened the letter in a tiny kitchen in the back and they only whispered. So during the Civil War, the Chinese Civil War, my parents left their one year old child behind in China with the grandmother. And they had not heard about him uh, since then, since 1949, and this is already 1962. Uh, you have to understand. At that time, any correspondence between Taiwan and the mainland, if discovered, could lead to imprisonment and even death penalties. It's as harsh as that. So in this letter, I saw the letter too. In this letter, somehow brought to Taiwan from someone in Hong Kong, the lost, that lost child, that lost brother of mine, who was by then a teenager, he wrote by hand. I still remember the, word, the words in there. He pleaded that he planned to escape to Hong Kong by foot if my parents could manage to come to Hong Kong to meet him. My parents were, it's not possible for my parents to come to Hong Kong to meet him. Um, so 1962 was a very mem memorable year to older Hong Kongers. Many of you remember 1962. Some of you might have come to Hong Kong in 1962. That was to escape from the Great Famine, which lasted from 58 to 1961, 62, uh, in which researchers uh, claim 45 million people died from the three-year famine. Um, at that time, to escape from the famine, more than 100,000 uh, people have, from all over China have swarmed, streamed into the harbor area, uh, into, the, into the border area, Shenzhen area. At that time, Shenzhen was called Baoan, right? To that area, trying to get into Hong Kong. In April that year, each day, about 4,000 to 8,000 Chinese successfully entered Hong Kong and stayed. So at the end, uh, hundreds and thousands were allowed to stay, but 60,000 Chinese refugees were turned back by the British government. So I'm going to show you this. Again, I forgot. This is the, what is this? This was the Vietnam War. Okay, I mentioned it. Okay, where's this? Hong Kong, 1962. Uh, hundreds and thousands of refugees on the street. Uh, let's look at this. And how do I make this work? <laughs> By, no? Oh, yes. Communist Chinese vessels laden with foodstuffs arrive at the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. Despite widespread famine on the mainland, the Reds are continuing their food export trade. An estimated $10 million worth of food is sold in Hong Kong each month. Vegetables and canned goods from Red China line the shelves of retail stores. And there are plenty of customers for them, too. But what happens next is that the customers hurry to the post offices to mail the food in relief packages back to needy relatives in Red China. Having already collected foreign exchange money on the sale of the food, the communists now will collect import duty on the same food as it heads to destinations in the various provinces of China. The British Post Office Department handles the food packages as they would any other mail under the rules of the International Postal Union. And they're swamped with some 50,000 packages a day. No 
knowing that most Chinese refugees in Hong Kong have left relatives behind and will continue to share with them whatever they have, the Red Chinese regime can figure on food profits while there's famine in the land. Um, <clears throat> the older generation of Hong Kong must have a lot of stories to tell. I remember one story t which was told to me. Uh, when she was small, she would go back to Guangdong to visit her relatives. Uh, her mother, uh, her parents would take her there. The parents themselves would dress many, many, put down many, many layers of clothes on them. And the child as well, five layers, ten layers of clothing on them. So that, but when they come back, there's only one layer left. <laughs> you know? These are very heartbreaking uh, memories, uh, and you can see that uh, the relation between the relationship between the Hong Kongers and the Chinese. Uh, if you look at histories like this, I think you probably you should get a more um, human perspective on things. Uh, the next short film. Almost bursting at the seams, the colony of Hong Kong is invaded by new floods of would-be refugees from the mainland of China. As there's only shantytown accommodation for many of the million refugees already in Hong Kong, there's no room for the 4,000 a day who have tried to come in lately. Helicopters fly at first light, looking for Chinese who have entered the colony by night. Police round them up, for they've got to be sent back. So limited are the resources of Hong Kong that if the refugees were allowed to stay, famine and cholera might result. Yet as lorries take them back to the frontier, the Chinese have the sympathy of the people. The food, cigarettes and medicines are showered on them. Fear of approaching famine is thought to be the reason why so many have fled from their native South China, which normally no more than 50 a day are allowed to leave. Now the communist farming system has all but broken down, and hundreds of thousands are hungry victims of the Red Series. Well, again, I find it very heartbreaking to look at that part of history. Um, so a lot of things have changed, a lot have, has changed, but I just on the side, no matter what happens, I think that human compassion has to be there, no matter what happens. Okay, um, at that time, Sir Robert Black, serving as governor of Hong Kong from 1958 to 1964, he was informed in 1962, he was informed that at least one million refugees, squatters, remained in the colony. So he tried to warn the British government of the severity of the situation by saying that this was akin to uh, a city like, like Glasgow um, having to absorb one million refugees and finding the money to accommodate them. So uh, Robert Black uh, started a massive housing program in 1962. Uh, so I was very pleased to learn that Governor Robert Black's daughter, Barbara Black, and her husband, um, Heinz Rust, are here with us tonight as well. Would you just wave to, um, to our audience? That's really very nice. Okay, good that uh, this lecture is in English. <laughs> okay, um, then for today's occasion, of course, I have to show this picture. Oops. Robert Black College. So this college was officially opened in 1967 to commemorate the services 
uh, Governor Robert Black uh, made to Hong Kong, and and to welcome international scholars and students to join the university and in an effort to try to turn uh, Hong Kong U into a university with a global vision. So that was already in 1967. And so Robert Black College is a symbol of that effort to make this institution very much worth a global vision. And I myself uh, attached to Robert Black, so I have benefited from this. So at age 10, uh, the, my world, our world, was very much defined by war, famine, refugees, poverty, displacement, 1962. Um, let me assume many, many of you here today are 20 year olds, like the reader who wrote to me. So let me share with you what surrounded me, what surrounded Long in Tai when she was 20. Um, if you think that terrorism is something new, you are very wrong. <laughs> In September 1972, what happened in September 1972? Remember Munich? A group of black September Palestinian terrorists broke into the Olympic village in Munich and killed 11 Israeli athletes. 1972 was also the year when almost every other day a bomb would explode where? Northern Ireland or the UK. In West Germany, the Red Army faction, a far left extremist group, were engaged in a series of kidnappings, bombings, assassinations, uh, bank robberies, and shootout on the street with the police. I lived in a place, a village called Kronberg, near Frankfurt. And that was in, already in the late 80s, I remember one of the neighbors was, was murdered. He was, the, he was the director, I think, of the Deutsche Bank. I don't quite remember, also Central Bank. So that, and, and by RAF, by this, by this extremist group. So it went on for many, many years. They stopped only after 1998. Um, 1972, when, when I was tw 20, it was also the year that the opening scene of probably the most important political scandal of the 20th century, which started to play out, which is what? The Watergate began. And it is very significant, especially we stand now at 2007 looking at the politics of the United States. All the more you, you realize that uh, that scandal, the Watergate scandal, was really the beginning where the trust in a democratic system began to erode. And we see what happens 50 years, uh, 40 years after that. Um, but I didn't really need to turn to the West to discover that something was wrong with the trust we had in the political institutions. Uh, one sunny morning in 1972, I was on my way bicycling to my classroom. I met uh, my a couple of friends on campus. I heard them whispering to me. They said, did you know so-and-so was arrested last night? He disappeared last night. So 1972. What happened was a group of students from Chenggong University, which is my university, uh, they were arrested and accused of treason. And some of them were sentenced to 25 years in jail term. And one even got death penalty, which later on was changed to uh, uh, 25 years imprisonment. Uh, what did they do? They formed a study group trying to read Karl Marx. 
1972. So, further on, um, did we use computers in 1972? Paul, did you use computers? <laughs> no, I don't remember. I, well, maybe Hong Kong was more advanced than Taiwan. Did you know? We used typewriters for our papers. That was really work. <laughs> okay, and um, the the most. Do you remember the most advanced uh, uh, electronic gimmick of 1972? Does anybody remember? The newest thing on the market was the first handheld scientific calculator HP 35. Do you know how much it cost? 1972? 395 US dollars. Nobody could afford it. That was 1972. Okay, when I, when I was 20, when we were college students. And uh, you are not that dumb to ask us if we use emails, right? No. We wrote letters by hand. I was madly in love with somebody who was studying in Taipei. So we wrote each other every day. And um, like in the 18th century, we um, wrote letters every day, and we wrote by hand, and we sealed the letters with kisses, and we walked to the post office, and we bought beautiful stamps. You pick stamps. I want the stamp with the bird on there, and I want this one with flowers on, you know? And then uh, you tenderly uh, glue the colorful stamps onto the envelope. And then with love in your heart, you walk to the mailbox and, uh, and carefully uh, you put the letters into the mailbox <laughs> and waited for the postman to chime his bicycle bells. Okay, so that was when we were students. Um, wouldn't you say a lot more romantic than you are today, what you do today? Everything is instant. You have never tasted the sweetness of waiting. <laughs> what a loss. Um, so, how do we define the students of the 1970s? They were born in the aftermath of World War II. They grew up with the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and so on, and the subsequent suppressions, repressions. With war always comes poverty, displacement, and a very powerful sense of insecurity. Of insecurity. So, if you find the baby boomer generation, us, very frugal, you know, the story I used to tell is, again, with my, uh, my, my, my partners at home, the, the two, two teenagers I had. So given a basket of apples, and some of them are already half rotten, uh, what do you pick to eat first? We would, of course, pick the half rotten ones. You eat them first. You don't waste. Um, but they, the, the millennials, they would pick the fresh, the crispy ones first. And um, they argue with me because your logic is wrong, they said. If you start with the half rotten ones and the fresh ones become rotten next day, which means you are always eating the rotten apple. You never taste even one crispy fresh ones. Uh, are they right? <laughs> I think yes, <laughs> they are right. Uh, so that's that really is because they didn't experience poverty. Um, but when you come to the, the generation, my parents' generation, how would they eat the apples? They would definitely start with the half rotten ones, but they would not be like me, throw away the, the rotten part. They would pick up, collect the rotten ones and go to the yard to feed the chickens and the pigs, probably. Right? So. It was different. And so, um, if you define students in the 1970s, <coughs> and you find them frugal, there's a reason for it. And if you find them overly goal-minded and competitive, uh, that is because in a ruined world, they were taught by their parents, they were taught to persevere in order to survive. 
And if you find them lacking in um, understanding, in the understanding of the fun in life, they, they live to work. They don't, uh, uh, they, they, they live to work, not the other way around. Oh, okay, if you, if you are critical of them because of this, that's because they have never seen anything else. Okay, so they, then the, my parents, the parents of the baby boomers, they are probably, if they are alive, they are in their 90s, okay, had lost their youth, their opportunities in life, their dreams to achieve. So they urge their baby boomer children, us, to firmly grasp every opportunity to thrive, to fulfill, to advance, to propel, to conquer. That's why we were brought up that way. So it is therefore ironic, I find it very ironic that the baby boomer generation is my generation as parents that we, our generation, complain about the younger generation for lacking drive, uh, for not working hard enough, or being too smug about achieving small. Just opening a cafe, you know, as fashion, xing, little, little tiny bits of happiness, you know? <laughs> So small, you achieve so small, your dreams are so small. I find it ironic that my generation would be critical of the youth in this manner because this generation, our generation, has worked all our lives exactly for this goal, that is to provide a more secure and more comfortable infrastructure for their children, the, 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 the millennials, so that the millennials could afford higher education and diverse life choices. Isn't that exactly what you worked for? And now you are criticizing them for the way you want them to be. There's, there's an irony in there. However, if you find your professors, deans, chancellors, government policy makers, many of them were sitting here, okay? <laughs> if you find them, <laughs> if you find them, mostly students of the 70s, if you find them incapable, incapable of understanding you and communicating with you, well, I think there is some truth in it. And there's, again, a generational reason to it. Let's say if you are 20, then you were born in 1997. Let's talk about 1997. So what is uh, the most significant thing to 1997? <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of what you are thinking. <laughs> I'm not talking about the return of Hong Kong to China. <laughs> Nor am I talking about uh, Princess Diana being killed. I don't know what you have in your mind, okay, the year you were born. Um, I'm talking about the deep blue. Deep blue, the year you were born. What's deep blue? IBM deep blue chess playing computer in 1997. I forgot again. <laughs> This is the Olympic. <laughs> and this is the red letter writing. I still do it today. Uh, this is my writing, and that is a mailbox in where? Oh, uh, no. The one on the left is in London. The one to the right is in, oh, I searched all over. I walked, I think I walked for one hour to find a mailbox. That was... Uh, that was Belgium, Brussels. The right one is in Brussels. Okay. Oops. <laughs> now, 1997. In 1997, um, Deep Blue defeated Kasparov, the champion, chess champion. So this dramatic defeat of machine over man marked a significant point in the development of artificial intelligence that really started when you were born. Okay? And then in 2007, 2007, like me, in 1962, I, I entered my formative years, and you entered your formative years in 2007, 
So what's important to 2007? Anything that's big? <laughs> All right. I'm not talking about Romania and Bulgaria joining the EU. <laughs> uh, nor am I talking about uh, who, who, who died in 2007. Pavarotti? Okay. Uh, I'm talking, I am talking about something that changed the world, something that changed, that made what you are. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. That changed the whole world. That changed history. Um, columnist, col columnist Thomas Friedman, he pointed out that 2007 was a pivotal year where Facebook and Twitter really took off. Airbnb was born. Amazon Kindle was launched. Android mobile operating system was announced, which made smartphones available to everybody on the street, 2007. The cloud, 4G, applications combined with globalization and climate change became a force, a very, very powerful force to be reckoned with in 2007. Friedman calls what happened in 2007 a hurricane. That's your formative year. So this hurricane of technology shapes millennials into, I think, a new human species. While the silent generation, my parents, the baby boomers, the X generations all have to struggle with this ex accelerating digital hurricane. The, like the, it's, it's like us struggling with it. It's like uh, the driver of a horse-drawn carriage trying to operate a space station. Okay. Um, that's how trem tremendous the, the change is, but you, the I generation, were born digital. You don't know anything else. You were born digital. So therefore, the generational divide is essentially a digital divide, and the divide is huge, really is huge. The baby boomers were once rebellious. If you think we are conservative, we, we were once not conservative. Um, they were once rebellious and had radically changed the world. Now this is 2000 and we are entering 2018. You have to remember what happened in uh, 1968. Okay, this is all taken from 1968. The youth, the young people uh, of, of the 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s. But the baby boomer generation who were radical or activists before, they still hold respect for elitism based on meritocracy. They still do. While the I generation finds, them, finds themselves in a flat world where everyone is his or her own spokesperson. What a contrast. The baby boomers may still trust the traditional ways of gathering information, trusting the traditional established media, for example, to form opinion. The I generation has turned away from the established media and forms judgment through peers in a virtual world. If the parents' generation, us, value solidness, as a positive quality. This guy is very solid. It's a praise, okay? If we still value solidness as something positive, for the I generation, it is fluidity and free flow which matters more. So the question remains, if the teachers do not catch up with new technology, we professors, 
How do we teach the I generation? And if the opinion leaders, columnists, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the opinion leaders do not understand that the world is really flat, then how do they impact the public? If the political leaders do not comprehend how the I generation form opinion, how do they govern and how do they lead? Then reversely or conversely, if the young, the younger generation, if they don't believe anymore in what their, gen their older generation tries to tell them, with what do they go forward? With what? So, I see the need for a bridge. Students of the 1970s must, we must learn a new way of communicating. We must learn it. And the students of 2017, the younger generation here, must try to reach for the content which older generations value. Because no matter how technology takes where it takes us, I don't think there is no limit to it. And I tell you in a very simple way where I think the limit is. An AI robot can beat me in chess. But do not tell me a robot can beat me in the intensity of sorrow, in the subtlety of tenderness, or beat me in the depths of thought. In other words, if you add water, if you add salt to water, tell me, does it make a teardrop? Is it a tear? No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay. So, and no matter how rich, how diverse, how exciting the tech world is, I think the content of Shakespeare of Lao Tzu and Confucius, of Goethe and Socrates, still needs to be read and be read in more than 140 characters. So technology can be a facilitator, but it definitely is no replacement. Finally, to believe or not to believe is today's title. It, it really has to be a very personal homework that everybody does for her or himself. And to end today's talk, I want to give you my um, midterm report. Here it goes. Um, I used to, okay, I have to read it. This is, this is the report. I used to believe that one must love one's country. I have learned that how country is defined is a suspicious thing. Oftentimes, the country defined by those who most eagerly urge you to love turns out to be rather unlovable. I used to believe in history. I have learned that history is half fabrication. The victor writes the history of the defeated, and when the victor gets defeated, the history is rewritten again. I used to believe in the resilience of civilization. I have learned that ignorance and barbarity do not disappear with the progression of civilization. They only, they only assume different forms. And between barbarity and civilization, there is only a really very thin line. I used to believe in justice until I discovered that Two justices can exist, can exist at the same time, and they collide. If you choose one of them, you commit injustice as well. When heroes or leaders claim one justice, you actually could discern a hidden injustice if you look hard enough. I used to believe in idealists until I discovered that idealists tend to fail the test of power. Either they do not have the ability to exit, pure, exit power to serve their idealism, or they are simply corrupted by the sweetness of power. I used to believe in romantic love. 
But later on, I realized that romantic love must turn into a mundane, quiet relationship in order to last long. It's like an ice cube melting in a glass of water. But is it still love? Um, but there are many things that I do believe with no questions. Here they are. For instance, I may be suspicious about the concept of a country, but I definitely could devote my love to the land and the people. That's for sure. History may be half lies, but the pursuit of what is, of what is true becomes all the more necessary and exciting. Civilization may be very vulnerable, but all the more it proves that to keep it going strong is a worthy cause. The pursuit of justice may be deceitful, but at the lowest denomination, to uphold justice provides more security than to denounce it. Idealists may be dwarfs when it comes to action, but without idealism, this world would definitely look darker. Love may lead to disillusionment, but you adore the dancing fireflies. Do you know what fireflies are? What is in Chinese? Ying Huo Chong. Okay, love might lead you to disillusionment. This is very important for your uh, millennials. But you adore the dancing fireflies at night, not because you need light. If mountains would crumble and rivers would dry up and eternity does not exist, then for sure there is some truth in the Buddhist saying that there is eternity in a grain of sand, which I believe. Final words. Final words. As a principle, I believe in love. I believe that love and kissing lots and lots of kissing, are the best exercise against cold, against depression, against aging, against cancer, and against bad grades. I believe self-confident women, self-confident women, are the most attractive women. <laughs> Definitely, believe me, the girls here. And finally, finally, for, for today, I believe in angels. Have you seen angels, John? Have you seen angels? <laughs> Barbara, have you seen angels? Have you seen angels? Have you ever seen angels? I believe in angels. If you are curious, open-minded, and never give up, you Angels will find you and hold you when things go wrong. Angels will be there. So that's the final words. Curious, be open-minded, and never give up. Thank you very much. Shall we stay with this one, this picture? Which one do you like to be the, uh, the one that you keep in your head when you go away? This one? Okay, choice one, choice two, choice three. Which one? Uh, choice one. Love and lots of kissing, right? Choice two, be confident. Choice three, you always have an angel. Okay, choice three. <laughs> All right, um, we have we have only seventy minutes. There you go. Um, there are two microphones standing here in order to save time.
you come forward. But because there are only 17 minutes, I would suggest that uh, only three on each side, and that's the evening is over. And then you have to go back to your parents and be nice to them. <laughs> uh, all the others, do, uh, let's save time so that, uh, why don't you just come out uh, so that we don't waste time? Anybody else? Upstairs. Do you want, to, okay, yes, why don't you jump down? <laughs> <laughs> Quick. All right. Anybody for this side? All right, please. Uh, thanks, Prof. Long. And uh, my name is Hao Dan, and um, I've read your books and uh, get influenced a long time ago. And so today I have two questions. And the first one is I think you mentioned that uh, the advancement of technologies, and uh, so uh, you mentioned that the hard times and the wars and all this stuff, the early generation experienced. And so it, it make them difficult to sometimes to believe. But I feel that the advancement in technology actually make the younger generation difficult to believe as well in a sense that, first of all, I think, uh, for, for example, the first example is like the, the, the US president election. I think if um, there's no such advancing technologies, um, if, if um, the advancing technology exists earlier, there may be more uh, Nixons or uh, Bill Clintons. So the, because of the information captured, um, and, and, and I think that's why people feel so, I mean, almost uh, the whole world feel disappointed about this year's, eh, this year, last year, last year, sorry, last year's uh, president election because, I mean, even both, I mean, there's no perfect candidate because everyone has something that, it, I mean, it's just a lot of information captured. And another thing is that I think it's because of the channel, a lot of channel for information to distribute to everyone. So I think it's really, um, it's very easy. It's easier for others, for, for the uh, for the fake information to be distributed. So for, I think for the younger generation, especially for us, we don't have a very established value for the world and for you know, the human, human nature, all this stuff. It's very easy for us to create doubts or, I mean, it's difficult for us to believe. I, want, I, I just stuff. want to thank you for your comments. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have a question? No, no, I, I just want to hear your, um, your, your perspective about this. Was, uh, um, the, it's an essay, so I, it's better <laughs> if you give me one specific question that I can answer better. Okay. Um, then, then, then maybe, maybe I have only one question. All right. Yeah, so um, actually I, I just mentioned that I'm really very excited be uh, because I fl flew from Singapore here. Oh, really? Because Let's give her some applause, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Because um, you are my favorite writer, so I was really, really excited to see you and your speech today. And uh, I'm very I, happy to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I just because I, I think uh, I mean I, I just want to give you a few um, uh, facts that how 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 the how big the influence to my life. So now I. I worked in a German company, and I, <laughs> I feel so excited to, you know, I even almost uh, nearly fell in love with someone named Andrews because <laughs> but the... D don't, don't, don't easily marry them. Uh, no, no. <laughs> even, even though I want the, I mean, it's not my, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think I don't receive any, <laughs> any reaction from the outside. So, so I mean, it's, I don't know whether it's because of your book or I, I don't know. And also, I think you are, you, you contribute a lot to the excellence of my English speaking. I, I was in, I was born in a small town to the north of Chengdu. I originally from China. So I think that uh, that's why I think some, of the reason is because I read your book, or, or I, I don't know, but I come to, I mean, I go out to the world and understand more and all this stuff. And also I even did a PhD, but I, ha I didn't finish it, but I, I don't know, man. I mean, That's a lot of fine, don't be nervous. <laughs> Say one question for okay, me. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I want so you to so really give me so one very simple, yeah. simple question so my, so before my, you go home. Okay, so my question is, can I take a picture with you and can I get... <laughs> And can I get two signatures from the two books I, okay. I, I have? Uh, I can answer. help you take it. 
<laughs> the answer is very easy. Thank you for the easy question. I will take a photo with you. Would you take a photo with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. will. Okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. Sure. And, and uh, I, will sign, I will autograph the, the, the books for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. And, and can I ask the one simple other question? Because uh, <laughs> Very simple, because yeah, others I, I are waiting. Very, okay. so, because very simple. you mentioned that at the beginning of this speech, you mentioned something that, uh, so you received some letters from the, re the yes. readers, right? Yeah. So you, uh, I, I just want to know the address so I can, oh, yes. I can okay. write you letters. Thank you, because maybe other people want to know it too. Yeah. Okay. I, I just follow your Facebook, and I yes. don't know whether you can receive this. Sure. Email. If it's simplified character, if it's simplified character, I have a Weixin Gong Zhong Hao that you can find, okay? And then for the traditional character, then I have the Facebook. But on the Facebook page, there are fake ones. So uh, you have to find the one in the red uh, sweater with a cat. That's me, that's the real one. Okay, it's very nice having you. Hope to see you again. I definitely will, will autograph it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> i come to this side. Please. All right, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, I, I'm, I'm also from mainland and I uh, went to university in Canada and moved here for work. And it's been three years in Hong Kong. And uh, my question is, first, I don't think, actually, I think you're one of the I generation. Because you have Facebook, you have fake Facebook accounts <laughs> that I don't even have. And, uh, <laughs> and also you, do your, you have your WeChat uh, Gong Gong Hao. And, uh, but for me, uh, for my case, is I really like the story that you told about how the generation gap between you and your sons. And how you, they told you you are an uh, uh, impulsive buyer. But for me, my experience is my parents, they're born in the 50s as well. Uh, 1955 and uh, so they experienced a lot of the similar things also the great farming like you mentioned earlier and uh, so I truly respect everything they did throughout their life to provide for my generation for me and uh, uh, but it comes to mind like they are still living that life they count every penny mm -hmm. after they had a good life after they made a good life they still count every penny they still live a very, uh, how can I say? They, They're they, very frugal. Yeah, they, they don't but go out and buy clothes for what, themselves. But what do you want to say? Yeah, so I'm saying, how does this generation go back and reach out to the yes. older generation? You have asked a very, very crucial question. That, that really is the question for, for tonight. Okay, you find that your parents already have enough money, but they are still so frugal. They are not enjoying life, okay? I want to give you one example. Um, I, actually, I, I wrote this in, in one of the books. Um, my father was a, almost 83. And uh, he was still very healthy and very active, uh, and he still flirted with women <laughs> who, were, who were also in their 80s. And he, he loved to drive his small car, taking my mother along, and uh, travel around Taiwan, everywhere. Um, and then, but his reaction was getting slower, so he had a series of small accidents, one after another. And we, the children, got very nervous. What happened if he runs over somebody and uh, somebody dies from it? So we got very nervous. So I had three brothers. The three brothers came to me and said, Ying Tai, you are the one who talks to him. <laughs> he shouldn't drive anymore. Um, that's exactly what I did. I went to him. I think he just had an accident and my mother broke her arm because of the accident. Um, and I think he knew what was coming. This daughter sat in front of him in the sofa, in the living room, and I, he had a guilty look on his face. So I said, yes, give it to me, the keys. And he did, put it in my palm, put it in my hand. So uh, I actually confiscated uh, his car key. Was I right? Our logic was, we have enough money. Dad, anywhere and everywhere you want to go, hire a taxi. 24 hours. 
Isn't that good enough? Isn't that logic? And that's safe for everybody. This is what you think. Um, and we will pay for the taxis. What happened was, starting from the next day, he stopped going out. He stopped leaving the house, going out. No more. And he died uh, sometime afterwards. And um, I realized for his generation to spend money on taxis to go anywhere is something that he simply could not do. No way. You could put one million cash in his living room. He will not take the taxi. So did I do the right thing? No. I did not do the right thing because I should ha I had to take in consideration his generational history which I talk about today. I should have known that he would not he would stop going out at all and he he would die soon. I was wrong. I did not think about generational history. I didn't respect his past. This is just for you to think about. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Here you go. Professor Yang, thank you so much for all the stories. And I wish my father is still around to, to have um, the chance to listen to you because I have done exactly similar things. But with a second thought before my question, we may try to combine things together and ask your father, I mean, I mean, you could have asked your father to play video games about driving, and then this is a combination. <laughs> I should have, I knew, after Heinz, Heinz Yeah, side, of course. I should have hired a chauffeur, a driver and a car standing there, and if he didn't use it, he was wasting money. But they won't take taxi, but forget the, that. Right. But the essence is the younger generation did not take into consideration the generational history. That's the problem. Thank you so much. And then we learned so much about um, understanding um, next generations and uh, previous generation. My question is, um, while we are in this uh, world with so much information and there is so much talking about mindfulness, l mindfulness, uh, now you have multi multitasking, people going crazy, you spend 10 minutes doing mindfulness and then stay focused. Now you mentioned the this gener newer generation, they are born with the time. Multitasking is one of their like everyday life. Do you think there is um, a kind of a conflict? While one hand we are trying very hard to stay focused, and the other uh, gen newer generation, they are like that. So, do you see, or you may give us some intuition? Um, is it is it something conflicting? or uh, there is an outlet uh, somewhere um, in this labyrinth. Thank you. I do see a detrimental uh, effect of this um, time and age with an overdose of everything, multitasking, uh, grabbing, competing for your attention. I do see a problem there. I, uh, I think to be for an educator, education uh, scientist like uh, KM Professor Chen here, he probably have a lot to say w what it does to your mind when you are, um, your attention is constantly being occupied. But I would say only from one perspective, that is um, for a human being, solitude is something that is life-saving. Solitude is life-saving. And uh, with technology or without technology, you need to have the time and space to face only you in the universe, only you. So it's difficult enough for the, all the previous generations to put down the book, put down the phone, 
and leave your friends and be alone with yourself. It's hard enough. Now the younger generation, no matter where they are, they are connected. I definitely believe this being forever connected is detrimental to your mental health and to your personal fulfillment. And uh, so, the I hope the younger generation or the, the future generations would have the wisdom to know that this is so essential. How do you create the time and space for solitude is a huge task and huge challenge for you. To, dis to be disconnected, to be unplugged, is life-saving. Okay? Please. Hi. Hi, Long Intai. time no see. How how you meet you? Yeah. Uh, in Thai, we have a boiling planet. We see um, melting ice shelf and ice sheets. Um, yes see dramatic climate change and even uh, in the latest news um, the number of insects is yes. reported to plummet by by 75 percent also uh, we we see um, AI and robots approach to take away the jobs and dreams of hundreds of millions of people in the coming decades um, the younger generation uh, increasingly shackled by the pile of debts borrowed by the baby boomers in many places. Um, the democracy that hundreds of millions, or perhaps millions have died for are malfunctioning. So tell me, um, do you think our younger generation will grow old in a brighter world or not? Okay. If your answer is positive, what, what makes you so optimistic? All right. Um, if you follow my Facebook, you probably know that I emigrated uh, August 1st this year away from Taipei into a southern country, a southern country in Taiwan, to Pingdong. I have emigrated. So now the new friends that I got to know are farmers, uh, gardeners, hunters, and so on. And I was going to visit a farmer who won medals for his cultivation of, I don't know the English name of it, Zhao Shu, Zhao Zi. No, not dates, Zhao Zi, it's like apples, like okay, apples, uh, orchards. He cultivates these fruit trees. So I was going to visit him. <coughs> And his, his huge orchards were covered by nets, okay? But he said, Long uh, Shi, but I have to warn you before you come, otherwise you'll be disillusioned. Because uh, we usually, under this huge net, we have hundreds and thousands of bees. We need bees. But today, what you are going to see when you come, they are not bees, they are flies, Ying. Because there are no bees anymore. The, the, the population of bees have gone down like this. Something like 50% less world population of bees. They are, you only see flies. So they thought, oh, we have to change our image and, and, and understanding of what flies are. So in the future, we're not going to talk about bees, uh, bees and uh, <laughs> we're talking about flies. <laughs> Honeybees, we're talking about honeybee, honey flies. But anyway, yes, um, the, and the birds population went down uh, drastically. I think the news report from Germany was the, the birds were 15% down because the insects were down. Okay. Um, so um, if you look at the, the, the earth, the, the earth, now a new term has come up. It's called not the Holocene anymore. It's Anthropocene, meaning that this this Earth is really entering a very. It's, it's, the Earth itself is endangered. Okay, unless human beings really drastically do something and put together the, the force to do something, it's going down. 
This is one thing. This is one aspect of life. Yes, on the one hand, we have to know that nothing is rosy. But then you ask me, so uh, the future generation, the younger generation today, should you be optimistic or is everything um, dark? I want to say the, the future of, of the Earth is really endangered. However, is pessimism going to help it? The answer is, of course, no. And that means that you have no choice other than staying optimistic, upbeat. You have to believe in angels. You, have, you still have to continue to be curious and open-minded and persevere and never give up. Then the angels will be there. And if you decide before you even march on, you say, well, it's all dark, then, um, well, go home and sleep. <laughs> That's not very fun. We have no choice but stay optimistic and just go ahead, charge ahead, and do it. That's all. No other choice. That's all we do. Okay. Especially for the young people here. <laughs> um, I think that, oh. Last question, please. Thank you very much for the last question. Um, my question is, five years ago when I was still a college student, uh, that was the uh, first few years of mobile phones, smartphones, and I would be the one at home uh, with mobile phones all the time in my head. And my parents will be like, can you stop looking at the phone and talk to me for five minutes? And five years later, uh, with everything uh, going so fast. Um, Your parents, parents don't talk to you. <laughs> yeah, I would be the parent. Uh, when I went back home for holiday, they would be like uh, <laughs> WeChatting with friends or colleagues and all the moments uh, sharing uh, on the WeChat. Yes. And um, it, it's, it's like the generation, generational <laughs> gap, a generation generational history is repeating itself. And um, what can I do as... I, I know what you can yeah. do. <laughs> I know what you can do. You know, I'll tell you what I do. When I'm with my friends to have dinner, for example, um, we put, I would put a glass in the middle of the table and said, during this, lunch, this dinner or lunch time, one and a half hours, two hours, anybody who picks out the iPhone and look at it is $100 in there. <laughs> if, and, and strict rule, no violations, that works. Go and try. Go and try. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank general education and the staff who have worked very hard behind the scene to make tonight possible. I want to thank Annie and Robert Black Jim here for all the support they have given me. And I want to thank Paul Tan and Andy Ho and John Cow here who have made me feel always at home here. Uh, I'm very, a small note, I'm very happy that my, uh, my, my, my Gui Mi friend, Qing Xia, Lin Qing Xia is also here tonight. <laughs> Come on, this, that, is, that, is not, that is not very diplomatic or subtle for you. I mean, the way you react to her, <laughs> that is not nice. <laughs> that is not nice. <laughs> you didn't react that way to me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Let's work hard. Let's work hard for our future. Go home and have a different attitude with your parents, or go home and talk with your children. Between generations, there are bridges there to be built. So go home and happy. Lots of kisses and love, okay? Thank you, thank you, good night.